This week on To The Contrary, taking on the complexities of the mother-daughter relationship in a new movie. Then, civility, have we lost it as an aspect of the American character? Hello, I'm Bonnie Urbe. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, maybe it's the pandemic that won't quit, the political polarization, or both. Why are Americans so angry? And has a seeming loss of civility led to a decrease in our country's status as a great democracy? We see an increase in public anger in a variety of venues, from last year's insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, to parents screaming at members of school boards, passengers assaulting flight attendants, and people yelling at each other in stores about wearing masks. Academic studies are finding more hostility in workplaces, even when people are working remotely. And there's a pileup of anger on social media. In a report, Civility in America 2019, 93% of Americans identified incivility as a problem. 68% considered it a major problem. The report also found women are more sensitized to incivility and favor more action by parents, educators, and employees. Joining me today are Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, Republican commentator Ann Stone, George Washington University professor Laura Brown, and Republican strategist Rena Shaw. Welcome, everybody, and Happy New Year. Eleanor, are we really suffering a crisis of civility? Does it go much deeper and more violent than that? Or what's going on? We are suffering a crisis of incivility. It's because of isolation. When we're is- the way the reason we become civilized is that we have social a- interaction with one another. When that does not occur in person, you get the results we are seeing now. So you're blaming it on the pandemic, then, right? Uh, I'm blaming it on the forced isolation that the pandemic has put us to, yes. But you're on Capitol Hill. I remember seeing it start when I covered the house and Newt Gingrich began the very kind of personal, uh, you know, lashing out personally at at political uh, opponents, uh, which had had really not been done before, at least not in the current era. Um, And talk show hosts, started screaming on the radio 20, 30 years ago. You think it's just as recent as the pandemic? I think the pandemic has made it much, much worse. Uh, During uh, the pandemic, we have had business who can continue in the house. We've been on Zoom. uh, So we've had interactions, but the average person has been isolated in his or her own world. It shows us how important socialization is to having a society uh, that, in fact, uh, gets along. Uh, That's why we teach socialization to children. Babies cry, but when they interact with their parents and with other children, they become socialized. We've been desocialized during this pandemic. All right, Ann Stone, your thoughts. Uh, you are a, may I say so, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, a Trump supporter. And um, of course, a lot of this uh, in liberal circles is being blamed on, at least in part, on the former president because of his, uh, of, I don't, you know, because he lashed out. He was because of his rhetoric, time, yeah. et cetera. Um, it starts much earlier. Uh, it started 
you might say it started somewhat under Gingrich, but he, Gingrich and Clinton at least got along. Um, I'd say it really started to to go up or down, <laughs> downhill under Bush, and it's gotten worse and worse and worse. But I totally agree with Eleanor that um, the pandemic has spiked it, um, and isolation is a big, is a really big part of it. It's very interesting. Uh, I recently went back to my hometown and toured our new high school. <clears throat> my old high school was torn down, and I was very struck that in most of the classrooms. There were things up on the walls and in the hallways about being kind to each other, being civil, and a lot of emphasis on fighting this right at the classroom level. So I, you know, I think that the educators out there are aware that they've got to do something to try to get the next generation to get past that. I, I was very encouraged to see that. Laura, from an academic per perspective, what, uh, what do you think is going on and is there any solution? Well, I think there are three long-term trends that are really important to understand. The first one actually came to the fore with a book that was written in 2010 called The Shallows. And it was actually about what the internet was doing to our brains. And it was really focused on the fact that our current engagement online is all based around interruption and multitasking. And all of that creates a level of impatience, uh, which becomes problematic. In addition, um, when you're talking about other trends, the dominance of reality television, which is really predicated on um, conflict, outrage, and kind of shock, that has also permeated our culture. And so there is a sense that the correct way to behave is the way that you know, the housewives of Orange County behave to one another. That is problematic. The third thing, um, which I think we need to sort of delve into and talk about is actually the decreasing religiosity of Americans. Our founding fathers deeply believed that religion, whatever denomination, is what civilized you and allowed you to become an active citizen in the public space because religion in its best form is about love and humility. And in its worst, it becomes about self-righteousness and power. And unfortunately, we've had both kind of a decline in the people who say religion is important in their life. And then those people who are deeply religious are also not necessarily engaged in the practice of humility and love in the way that many of their doctrines say they should be. Okay, but I wanna go on to Rena, but Laura, I just wanna point out, you blame it on reality TV. What about decades before the, the likes of uh, Rush Limbaugh screaming at people on the radio for decades and decades and decades? And that's how all on the left and the right that, that I, I listen to, um, uh, um, uh, Radio America or something like that, that Rachel Maddow's first national platform. And she used to, uh, you know, she was nothing but- Sure, but, but Bonnie, I think you have to look at about how these media grew up together. Um, it's very important to understand that Jerry Springer um, was right. engaged in kind of throwing chairs. And Correct. this right. um, idea that kind of a plot point for a drama is an uncivil engagement. And that conflict then becomes the story upon which whole um, episodes and television series are based is problematic. Rena, your thoughts? Well, I have a number of thoughts, Bonnie, on this because I don't disagree with any of my co-panelists here. Isolation has certainly played a role. Uh, no doubt there are there's the problem of having him behind screens for so long, whether it's reality TV or hearing shrieking on talk radio for so long. And then add in the degradation of cultural norms. We have come to this moment in time of great incivility in American society because it was inevitable. American society was going to break down and has broken down over time so rapidly in this moment, though, uh, because of the erosion uh, of the American family family, of how we see the American family unit, and, uh, and frankly, how it functions as well. In, in general, we are less supportive 
of, of each other, not just in our own homes now, increasingly so, but in American life, when we go out into the public square, how often are people willing to sort of say, okay, let's agree to disagree. It has become about really who's the loudest and who can win out that way. Whereas when we were children, we're told that's not the way to win an argument. I want to make a couple points here, though, about incivility. And we know that as a general term, it describes social behavior that lacks incivility or good manners. And it can really range from rudeness to frankly disrespecting elders. Now, I'm, I'm the product of immigrants who originally are from India and Africa, and, and that was one really big thing in our cultures in India and Africa is this tremendous respect for elders. You must take care of elders at all costs. That comes first. Elevate the elders. What I've seen in American society is that we've shoved the elders away. So when we lack that wisdom, I think that also becomes problematic in the American family unit and bleeds out into society. But moreover, there's a, this, this tie to politicization that you were talking about earlier, about our politics of the day, how our leaders speak and act and, and react. Um, I think one thing for me in having made my career in politics over the past two decades uh, and government, I should add, is how, um, how I have seen politicians continue to put people in boxes, othered people. And a great problem of our moment is how we see other people. Are we willing to see them as neighbors, as part of this great social Amer experiment that is America? I think we increasingly we are unwilling to do so. And, and so that othering of people, putting them in boxes that they may not want to be in or be put in or wouldn't even describe themselves in, that's being done by external forces. That's been done by our leaders. I want to throw it out there and say, it, do, are we going to see more violence? Are we going, what if President, former President Trump is reelected? Re will he be? Uh, and 40% of Republicans say violence is sometimes justified to, uh, towards uh, getting political ends met. Um, what is the future for this country? Are we going to keep rioting and being uncivil toward each other, which I know are two different questions, but still look to the future. Is this going to go away or is it going to take down democracy? I don't want to say it's going to take down democracy entirely, but I want to say the problem is here to stay if we as individuals don't do our part. I, I know that people are often like, well, what can I do? Well, maybe we're just one or two people, but that's how change begins. And it's going to take a multi-pronged approach. I think it starts with strengthening the American family, the American community, and how we talk about what's acceptable anymore. And in this moment, it's a problem that is not going away because there's no accountability, it feels like, at many levels. And there also are not people taking personal responsibility for their part to better American society. So I certainly hope oh, it gets better uh, in our time. Eleanor, go ahead. Your thoughts. Is it uh, going to go away or ruin us? I can't believe it's going to stay. Uh, and I do think that it has been uh, flavored by the Trump presidency. Uh, and the cross currents that, that it has generated. Uh, I believe that in t if, the, if the former president is reelected, it is going to stay. Uh, but if not, I think in time, the American people will come back to themselves. Laura? Well, I think that it probably is here to stay for a while. But the problem is, is that all of the incentives that exist in terms of making money in this country, encourage it. So we have a lot of different platforms, whether they are social media or entertainment type television that actually do promote this. So it is- Because, more, it, because supposedly it increases ratings, although- But it also increases all viewers, right? The number of followers, the number of, you know, the ability of you to be an influencer is partly about how loud can you make yourself and how outrageous can you um, sort of behave. So there is no incentive to even just things like saying please and thank you, whereas there are many more incentives, um, you know, to be saying many worse things, even things that don't sound like they should be bad, like let's go Brandon. Okay. All right, uh, Anne, your thoughts. <laughs> well, I was going to say, 
listen again to what Rena said and what Laura said, especially about the family and about the breakdown of religion. Uh, if we really want in the long term to deal with this, those are two issues very important to this. But one of the, one of the other big parts is the media. We've got to get the media to start emphasizing unity and, and finding ways to help bring us together because they're part of what's dividing us, number one. Number two, um, I think there is a thirst in the country for things to change. I think a second Trump presidency will not divide as much as the first did because he, he won't be running again. Um, so therefore, there's going to be hopefully less reason for the constant turmoil and um, insecurities coming out of him. But um, I have to say that one of the biggest problems is the two sides really don't understand each other. And if you read stuff from the far right and stuff from the far left, you wonder what planet both are on because their views of each other are so distorted. You can't get people together until you get them together and get them to listen. And Search for Common Ground, which is a great organization, international organization, one of their tenants is they have you take a survey um, and they survey what you think about yourself and what you think about your opposition. And always, it's so different. And that's one of the first ways they break down the walls because they publish the results while you're in the room and they show people how distorted their view is of the other. And it helps break down the walls and get people to talk. And All we right. still have that problem today. They're, they have totally distorted views of each other. The uh, Search for Common Ground, their process for getting people who outside the room would have killed each other, and I mean that literally, not figuratively, um, and get them in the room and on a whole host of issues, but I've seen it on the abortion issue, of course, and get people who never would even be in the same room to actually talk and, and work together. Unbelievable. And there is a process where you can break down the walls and get civility and get people yeah. to work together. It's and great. I, I do think we've all just become so impatient so impatient and so self-centered um, because of it. All righty, thank you all on this. And I just wanna say that there are academics who say that uh, religion is just as divisive, if not more divisive than it is unifying. And it also builds up walls. Look at the Arab-Israeli conflict in the Middle East. Uh, so many conflicts are driven by religion. So there are two sides to that argument. On to the next, from, from incivility to motherhood. That's one of the questions the lost daughter attempts to unravel. The Netflix film introduces viewers to a 40 plus woman on a working vacation on a Greek island. Through flashbacks, viewers learn Lita is divorced and left her two small daughters for three years. Both mother and father were professors, but childcare and child rearing has been relegated to Lita. She left due to the demands of raising children while trying to advance her academic career. During the trip, Lita tells a pregnant woman about the difficulty of motherhood, calling it a crushing responsibility. The movie avoids the stereotypes of the doting mother or the evil mother, but it questions whether all women are natural mothers. Rena, you have two small children. What do you think about the concept that not all women are cut out for motherhood? Well, goodness, uh, that is a tough a phrase to hear. Not all women are cut out for motherhood. I myself never set out to be a mother, but it happened and it was a great gift after I realized what a gift it was. Uh, when it happened, I wasn't prepared. I hadn't really planned on it, but some would say, well, you know, we live in the era of birth control. I said, well, the, my personal values led me to never take it and also health concerns as well. I just never realized that ch having children would change my life the way it did. And, and when women change, choose to not do that, I don't look at them any differently because I realize our choices are so nuanced. Um, they are difficult. And in this era where we have choices again to take a pill that prohibits us from doing so, I welcome the, 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 uh, the opportunity for women to have a conversation about what it means to be childless by choice. But I also think- well, 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 well. Child free. Child by free by choice. I Correct. know everybody else says childless, but it makes, <laughs> as a child free woman that- 
term makes me crazy. Go ahead. And we need to, and, and that's what we need. We need a change in messaging on how we talk about motherhood in American society. But I, I will say this is that motherhood is something that everybody, I hope, gets a chance to explore if they want to. If they okay. don't, we should welcome okay, we that got, as well. We got to move on. Laura, your thoughts about, um, I don't uh, know if you had a chance to watch the movie, but it's, it paints a very negative portrait of the the uh, professor. She is she sort of, she steals a doll from somebody else whose child has lost it. She's she doesn't do it on purpose. She's made out to be kind of crazy, and um, it's not a very flattering picture of her at all. So is that fair? Well, look, I do think that women wrestle with being defined as only mothers. And I do think that there is kind of a cultural overlay that many women uh, like myself who do not have children um, end up feeling as though somehow we are less than as a woman because we have chosen not to have children. And I do think that this um, film is wrestling with this idea of what does it mean to be a mother? Does, is every mother a good mother? Is it um, really the obligation of a woman who does become a mother then to be a good and thoughtful mother? I think um, you know, just having these conversations are really about what needs to happen. But you can almost guarantee that there will never be a film made unless it's made by a woman producer and director about are all men cut out to be good fathers, right? No, that's right. Look, I, I taught a class on women in politics. I had a class that was 12 women and two men because it was a senior seminar. And the women at one point got into a conversation about the pros and cons of having children early in their careers versus later in their careers, given what they wanted to do with their lives. And at one point, one of the, the seniors in the class uh, stopped and looked at the two guys in the class and they said, have you ever thought about this? And the two boys in the class said, no, we've never thought about trying to time motherhood to fit with our careers. And I think that that was really illustrative of the larger societal problem. The only right. uh, rest Ele is the woman. Right, exactly. Uh, Eleanor, bef uh, before I ask you to respond, I just want to note that at this point, about 20% of Americans are electing not to have children. And of course, a much larger percentage are electing not to get married, at least not before the children come along. Um, now, what they say in the future, polls show about 40% of Americans plan not to have children, probably mainly for economic reasons, but maybe not, maybe just because they look at the culture of this country, which is, you know, you gotta have kids, you gotta have kids. And they say, but that's not for me. What do you think? Well, this is a remarkable turnaround when you consider how we were raised. And I'm sure all of us are raised in the same way. If you were a girl, you had dolls. And those dolls were, supposed, were essentially training for motherhood. Boys didn't have dolls. They weren't trained for fatherhood. They were trained to grow up and be whoever they wanted to be. Young people, I think probably for economic reasons, are really thinking their own roles in society. And one of those roles is whether or not to have children. It may be for economic reasons, but it may be for other reasons as well. Uh, this is happening before our very eyes. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure the world has taken note of it. Uh, but with population uh, no longer growing, we see some countries actually paying people to have children. The United States may get to that point as well. All right, and your thoughts, Anne? Well, in my family and in my circle of friends, I have a slew of women who are both uh, mothers and career women. And what disturbed me about the book is it almost made it seem like you couldn't 
Um, you know, if, if you choose to have a career somehow that was going to make you a lousy mother. So I did take offense at that. But as you know, I chose not to have children, but in large part because of who my ex-husband was, I decided the world deserved a break. And someday the Nobel <laughs> Peace Committee will nominate me for a prize because his <laughs> next wife was beyond childbearing. But that's a whole other story. Um, and it's going to be interesting, too, to see where the discussion goes in the future, since Elon Musk now says the number one problem in the world is going to be underpopulation in the future. So that's a whole other whole other discussion, a whole other show. All right. Thank you all so much. That's it for this edition of To the Contrary. Please follow us. Us Continue the conversation with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and visit our PBS website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more. PBS.